All right. John chapter 4. So for those of you that weren't with us while we were, you know, in John chapter 4 on Sunday nights, you get a little bit of a lesson from John chapter 4 this morning. Now, uh, if you would, look down at verse number 22. John chapter 4, verse 22. He says, this is what Jesus says. He says, ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. And we'll talk about the last part of the phrase there momentarily. Uh, but this is the, the, the verse that I want to preach off of this morning where Jesus says, ye worship what ye know not what. Right? So what is he saying there? He's telling the Samaritan woman, like, you don't get it. You don't really understand why. You don't really understand what it is that you're worshiping. And so the subject of this morning's sermon is worship. Uh, and this was brought on by our conversation the other day after, what was it, Wednesday after church? Brother Mike told me that he knew somebody that was going to come here. Uh, or was thinking about coming, right? And then uh, I guess he, he may have looked us up or whatever and was like, well, how do you worship? Right? How do you worship? Basically implying that we don't worship, right? Because we don't have the rock band and we don't have the lights and we don't have all the emotionalism and all the feelings, you know, being poured out and pumped into your minds. You know, they, uh, they, they look at that as we're just dry or we don't have the spirit or, or whatever, you know, we, we're just not doing it right. Um, out soulening, this is a common thing that people will ask us, especially here in the Treasure Valley, because everybody in the Treasure Valley pretty much goes to church. And guess what? Every church out there just about, you know, probably what, 95% of them have in common? The rock band, the light show, right? What pleases the senses. And so there's this misconception today in Christianity on what worship is. But we're not like that, right? We understand that as fundamentalists, as real Bible-believing Christians, that we get our doctrine, we get our understanding from the Bible. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to take a look at what the Bible says worship is. And we're going to have this, obviously, on our YouTube channel so that when people have questions, hey, what, how do you worship? What does that really mean? You can hopefully, you know, point them to this sermon and maybe it'll clear some stuff up for them. Now, keep your place there in John chapter 4 because we will come back to it. But turn over to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter number 1. So you say, what is worship? You hear that a lot. Praise and worship, right? Praise and worship music. You know, oh, at our church, we sing praise and worship music, and it's great. You know, we're really serving God. But is that true? Is that true? Are they really serving God? Is, is serving God, you know, raising your hands and getting all emotional on Sunday morning and then going right back into the world, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you go to your small group and you talk about the football game and you talk about the basketball game and you read a couple different verses from like eight different versions of the Bible and then you go back to church Sunday morning. Is that really worship? Is that really the God of the Bible? Is that what Jesus Christ wants from his followers? Of course, the answer is definitely no. So what is the word worship? What does that mean? Well, if you study it in the Bible, you'll see that God is the one to be worshiped, right? It means worth. It means uh, worthiness. The, the, the word worship comes from the word worth-ship. It's what or who is worthy to be given honor and admiration. Um, if you were to read the, def the definition from the dictionary, it would say this. Worthiness or worship is to give at its simplest worth to something. Now, a lot of people will criticize this and be like, you know, you guys are out here soliciting and you're begging for money. And, you know, I, I believe that religion, organized religion is bad and I should just be able to worship God in my own, in my own home. And, and that's my church, right? We get that about once a week around here, you know, which is, is kind of funny because so many people go to church, but there's still those, those types out there. But these same people have no problem paying all the money to go to the football game, right? To go to the rock concert, right? to go to the baseball games, to do their entertainment. They've got no problem giving their worth, their hard-earned money to that, which doesn't profit them other than, you know, in this present time. There's no eternal value in that. So these people, they say they worship God. They say they believe in Jesus Christ. They've got no problem giving their finances. They've got no problem giving their heart, their mind, and their soul to their favorite musicians or sports players. But yet you try to give them a gospel message and they say, you know what, I don't really, I don't really need that. I just worship God in my own way. And yes, and, and these people will often say, yes, I'm a Christian, right? That's, that's, you ask them, are you Christian? Yeah, we're a Christian. I just don't believe in organized religion. Well, that's kind of funny because the Lord Jesus Christ believes in organized religion. It's the whole Bible's about. So that is what it means. Um, now, you, you, often with the term worship in Christian circles, you're going to hear the word praise. And praise just means to uh, give approval or um, 
of, of someone or something, right? It's, you know, oftentimes you may be at work or, you know, out in the world and you hear that somebody got a praise award or somebody got praised at work. It doesn't mean that you're worshiping them. It just means that you're giving somebody, uh, you know, approval. That's what it means. And I'll tell you what, most Christians today, what do they give approval to? The entertainers, yeah. right? Hollywood. Right. All things that go against God in what His Word says. Yep. So, now, are we to praise God? Absolutely. The Bible says that. And we're going to look at that this morning in great detail. So we are supposed to give our worship, our praise to God. But just keep in mind, there is a difference between the word worship and the word praise. You know, sometimes in our language, we use the word praise and we're not talking. You know, if you give somebody praise, it doesn't necessarily mean you're worshiping them. OK, you know, so, so if your boss gives you a work, you know, it's like, I just want to praise you know, Brother David over here for doing a great job, he, his boss isn't worshiping him at the time. Okay, so there is a difference in the word. So just keep that in mind. So real quick here, I just want to show you these elements, worship, praise here in these verses. Now, Hebrews chapter 1, look at verse number 6. It says, And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. Right, so this is obviously talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And what does it say? Not just humanity that worships him, but all the angels of God. Look at verse 7. It says, And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Now look at verse 8. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. We use this out soul winning all the time to prove that the Bible does teach that Jesus Christ is is God. He, you know, he, he is God. A lot of people will say, well, no, he's just the son of God. He like, meaning he, he began, you know, when he was born of the Virgin Mary. <laughs> and it, it's just, it's just bizarre. I mean, the Bible says, uh, for God was manifest in the flesh. Yeah, right. It doesn't say, you know, for little Johnny was manifest in the flesh. It doesn't say that, it, you know, that for a man was, uh, manifest in the flesh. It says for God was manifest in the flesh. And that should be enough for these people, right. by the way. You know, when you give these people that verse and they're just like, well, you know, that doesn't really mean that he's, you know, that the Trinity's true. And it doesn't really mean that he's on the same level as God. It's like, do you not know how to read English? Can you not hear? It says for God was manifest in the flesh case closed. Yep. Done deal. It is, it's over. Now, real quick, go to chapter number three, Hebrews chapter number three. And then we'll get back to John here. Go to Hebrews chapter number three and look at verse number three. It says, for this man, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, for this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more glory honor than the house. So the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ obviously has more worth, is more worthy to be praised than even Moses, and I will tell you, than any of the prophets, than any man alive. So it is okay to worship God. That's what the Bible teaches us, and you can read about that all throughout the Bible. We're going to take a look at this. Now go back to John chapter 4. You know, so people, the, 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 the issue here though is not about whether or not we're to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's about how. What does the Bible say? Right? That's the big debate today. Now, while you're going back to John chapter 4, I'm going to read for you Psalms 18, verse 3, which says this, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. So the Bible says that the Lord is worthy to be praised. We just talked about that, right? We are not always worthy to get praise. Does that make sense? But he is always worthy to be praised, no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what situation that you're facing. He is always worthy always worthy to be praised is what the Bible says. Whereas for us, you know, we do something good today, tomorrow we do something bad. You know, we're always up and down. We, we don't have that consistency because we're all sinners. We're not perfect. We're dead. Without Christ, we are literally nothing. So back to John chapter four, point number one this morning is the debate is that I want you to see regarding worship. The debate is over uh, I'm sorry, the debate over worship. I want you to notice the debate over worship here in this chapter. Look at verse 20. It says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Now, just a quick review. Why does she say this? Remember, she's a Samaritan. Now, who are the Samaritans? You remember? They were 
uh, the northern kingdom of Israel. Do you remember that? How they got, uh, they got taken into the captivity. They got conquered by the Assyrians. They got mingled with the Assyrians and they became known as the Samaritans. Because you remember after the, the nation of Israel got divided, right? Jerusalem became the capital of Judah. Samaria became the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. And after they went into captivity, they, they basically just became this mingled people and they became known as the Samaritans. No longer were they the tribe of Asher or Dan or Simeon or Naphtali. Right? They're just known as Samaritans, but they still have that memory. They still have the teachings. They still have that, uh, the, so, some of the, uh, the, the, uh, the religious background, if you will. Right? They know the stories. And so she's asking Jesus, like, why do you say that Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship? So this idea or this debate over worship is nothing new. It's, big, it's been going on with God's people <laughs> pretty much since the beginning. You know, because she's like, well, why do we have to go to Jerusalem? Well, you got to remember that when the kingdom split, the priests, uh, the Levitical priests, where did they have to go to do worship? They had to go to Jerusalem where the temple was, right? Why? Because Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he set up golden calves. He set up a false religion, right? He set up this fake Christianity in the, the, the northern kingdom of Israel. And so in order to do true worship, they did have to go to Jerusalem. But she doesn't really fully understand this, so she's asking him this. Now look at verse number 21. It says, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. And then in verse 22 where we first started, he says this, Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. And why does he say that? Because the Jews kept the oracles by and large, right? They were the ones that kept on teaching the word of God. They were, and, and I'm not saying they weren't without error. They didn't have their issues. Obviously, we've studied the kings on Wednesdays. You know they had their ups and downs, right? They had their good kings. They had their bad kings. But Jesus is saying, hey, salvation is of the Jews. Well, it's like me saying today, salvation is of the Christians, yeah. right? That's all he's saying. It was the Jews that had the truth. They had the gospel. They had the right answer. And so he's saying the reason why people worship in Jerusalem is because salvation is of the Jews and the Jews dwell in Jerusalem. The dwells, I mean, I'm sorry, the dwells, the Jews dwell in Judea, you know, and if you were to read Romans chapter two, you would learn what a real Jew is according to God, which is a Bible believing Christian. Okay. That term wasn't developed during this time, but nonetheless, you could say the same thing. Salvation today is of the Christians. So don't let that confuse you. Don't let that give you some kind of a Zionist type tingle because that's not what he's saying here. You see the Zionists, they read that. And they say, see, salvation's of the Jews. They're going to all just get saved miraculously and come back to God. And there's, that's not taught anywhere in the Bible. Right. right? So we need to remember that. But the thing that I want you to remember here from reading these verses is point number one. I just want you to notice the debate over worship. It's nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun. We literally have the same debate today. It's just a little bit different, right? When you go knock on somebody's door, they say, how do you worship? Why do you say that you have to worship the way you do with hymns and with the King James Bible? And we're going to get into that because Jesus said, hey, if you, the true worshipers, guess what? They worship God in spirit and in truth. And we will learn exactly what that means today. Now, again, keep your place there. John, we're going to come back there often. We're also going to go back and forth between the Psalms, but go to Genesis real quick. Go to the book of Genesis. Go to Genesis chapter number 24. Genesis chapter 24. And what we're going to do for my second statement this morning is we're going to look at some biblical examples of worship. Some biblical examples of worship. What does the Bible say worshiping or worship really is? What is the physical aspect of this? And I'll tell you the first thing that you're going to notice when you start studying the word worship in the Bible is you're going to notice bowing. Okay, you're going to notice bowing. Genesis 24, look at verse 26. It says, and the man, or I'm sorry, and the man bowed down his head and worshiped the Lord. Genesis chapter number 24, 26 says this, and the man bowed down his head and worshiped the Lord. So let me ask you a question. If you bow your head while you're praying, is that a form of worship? Amen. Yeah, it is, right? Not according to Storm, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Not according to Stormtrooper, because when we asked him that, you know, when, when some of you don't know what I'm talking about, and I'm sorry, but we had this bozo come in here and try to start trouble, and we, we cornered him on a Thursday, and we just started blasting him with questions you know, as we were kicking him out. And one of the things that we brought up that we noticed is that when everybody was praying, and I would be in the back, he's not bowing his head. He's actually looking around. Yeah. He's looking around at everybody, yeah. right? And when we challenged him with that, he said, show me the Bible where it says that you have to have your eyes closed, or show me where, and it's like, look, that's not the point. 
It's not the point. <laughs> the point is you're not doing what everybody else is doing. You're looking around and why? Right. Why is that? But it is in the Bible. It's right here. You know, if you have your head bowed, are you looking around? No. Are you participating in that act of worship at that time? And the answer is no, you're not. And that's one of the, 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 <laughs> the big clues that we, we got that this guy's definitely up to no good. He's up to something. But just, just real quick, I just want you to see this, an example of the Bible of what worshiping is. It's when you're bowing your head. So when you're bowing your head during prayer, guess what? You're actually worshiping God. It is biblical. Now, look at verse 52, same chapter, Genesis 24, 52. It says this, And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshiped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. And you say, what's the point? The point is when you do that, when you actually get on your knees and you pray to God, guess what? You're making yourself humble. You're saying, yes, I'm acknowledging that you're higher than me, that you're more important than me, that I'm nothing. I can't do anything without you. That's what you're saying. And you know what? Guess what? That is biblical. But is that what you see in these Christian churches on Sunday mornings? No, it isn't. What do you see? The electric guitar, the drums, and everybody wants to, you know, always fight about these instruments. Oh, how come you don't have instruments? Are you against instruments? Well, first of all, we're a new church. We have two piano players here and, and a couple little ones in the making. Right. You know, we don't have a large uh, plethora of people that can play, you know, the flute and the violin and, or, or the clarinet and all this stuff. You know, that'll come with time. Right? That'll come with time. But, but if people will often say, okay, well, where's the drums? Right? They want the drums. Why do you, why do you think they want the drums? Because that's what the world has. Yeah. Right? That's what the world has. Yeah. Now, I might be getting ahead of myself a little bit here, but you think about this. What are our vocal cords used for? for right? For singing, for, for communication, right? Our, our, our voice boxes, they have cords. They produce sounds and we form them into words and it's used to communicate. Well, you know what? A lot of these musical instruments are the same way, right? That piano, it has chords. Your guitar, it has chords. There's a lot of instruments that have chords. Why? Because it, what, I mean, not why, what does it do? It communicates sound. It projects sound. And guess what? That sound is a communication. It's just not in the form of words. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? It still produces a form of communication. So with that being said, it can either be used for good or it can be used for evil, right? I mean, I think everybody in here would agree that there's bad music and there's good music, right? And not just bad as far as like, oh, that guy can't sing, but like there's satanic music, right? There's fleshly, earthly, worldly type music, and then there's the music that praises God. When we got into that big fight with the Boise bench, over and over again in all the, the hundreds and hundreds of comments, I kept reading people saying, oh, I had to get through that awful music before I could hear that crazy pastor's message. That's what people just kept saying over and over again. I had to get through that awful music. Why, why do they call the, our hymn singing awful? Because it doesn't pull on the cords of your flesh, right. right? Think about that. If you want to get yourself psyched up, are you going to listen to Shall We Gather at the River? You know, do, is that what they pump into the soldiers' heads that go overseas to fight battle? No, they don't. They play corn. They play Metallica. They play Seven Dust. They play Stone Temple Pilots. That's what they play. Why is that? Because that gets their flesh roused up. Right. So there is a music in the world today that that basically communicates to your flesh. Right. We don't want anything to do with that. So why we don't have drums here and you say, well, drums, it doesn't say in the Bible that it's a sin. You're right. OK, fine. I just don't even want to go down that road. Right. right. We don't bring that stuff in here. We don't even have to worry about it. Right. You see what I'm saying? So that's why we do things the way that we do, because we want to worship God in spirit and in truth, not in error, not with emotionalism and not with feeling. So. Go to Psalm chapter 95. Psalm chapter 95. So just real quick, there's tons of examples of people bowing in worship in the Bible. Um, there's good examples like this. And then obviously there's bad examples of people bowing down to Molech and all these other idols and stuff, right? You can go to a Catholic church this morning and you can observe people bowing down to statues. Uh, there's people in other countries that bow down and kiss the Pope's toe. That's a thing, you know, and, and, and where's that in the Bible? I mean, think about that. What happened when uh, people would worship Peter? He'd say, get up. What are you doing? You know, I'm a man just like you. Don't don't do that. Don't get down like that. Right now. Did Jesus ever do that? No, Jesus always received worship. OK, now. So the first example that we looked at was bowing. The second one here is kneeling. Psalm 95 verse six. Let's look at this verse. It says, oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. 
So bowing down, kneeling, these are all forms of worship in the Bible. Okay, there's nothing wrong with doing those things. Now, if you would, um, go back a, a few chapters to Psalms chapter number 66, and we'll take a look at another example. And like I said, I think you get the point. Well, there's tons of examples also of people kneeling and stuff. There's nothing wrong with you going home, you know, praying to God, bowing your head, or kneeling, okay? And if anybody's, oh, that's Pentecostalish. No, that's not Pentecostalish, okay? That's Bible. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with getting humble before God. Now, the third example that I want to point to you is singing, okay? Singing is a form of worship. And like I just mentioned, it depends on what you're singing and how you're singing it, okay? So, Psalm chapter 66, look at verse number 4. It says, All the earth shall worship thee. Now, don't miss this. And shall sing unto thee. They shall sing to thy name, Selah. Now, is the Christian rap today, <laughs> is the Christian rap today really singing to God's name, to the Lord? No. They're singing to flexing and Smith and Wesson and, and whatever else. We've been studying uh, the Christian rappers as of recent, and it's been pretty interesting. I think I'm going to have to preach a sermon about them. But uh, that stuff is straight trash. It's trash. I sent Brother Skoke. Do you speak Dutch, right? Are you familiar with the Dutch language? He's familiar with, with Dutch words, okay? And, and I'm trying to understand what this dude is rapping about, this Christian homie rapper, right? I'm like, what? What? I can't understand what this guy's saying. Jessica's like, put closed captioning on. I'm like, that's a good idea. Guess what? It doesn't even recommend English. It recommends Dutch. And so I send this to Brother Skog. I'm like, can you help me understand this? And you recognize a few words, right? But the, 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 the bottom line is the guy doesn't know Dutch from anything. He probably doesn't even, he probably thinks Dutch brothers, right? When you say the word Dutch. He has no idea about any Dutch. But his English and his, his slang talk is so bad that YouTube or Google thinks he's speaking Dutch. Either that or it's the spirit behind that that's actually saying something in Dutch that maybe is, is satanic. I don't know. Uh, it definitely makes more sense than what he's saying. But it's just a straight trash. It's not edifying. It's not. It doesn't glorify God's name. And you say, well, yeah, the guy's saying, you know, glory to God, glory to God. Okay. That kind of sounds like what he's saying. But then every other word is flexing and, and Smith and Wesson. Well, how does that, how does that edify somebody? Right, right. I mean, think, come on, think about this. But you know what? We live in a world today where most Christians are going to tell you, hey, that's godly. And you shouldn't judge that person because he's getting people off the streets. He's taking the gang. No, no, no. That's not, that's not at all what that stuff does. Right. That stuff just justifies the world because it is the world. It's just a little bit milder. That's all it is. That's all it is. Now go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. So we just read Psalm 66, 4. It says, All the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee. They shall sing to thy name. So, you know, there's obviously more examples again in the Bible. So you study the word worship in the Bible, you're going to find people bowing, you're going to find kneeling, and you're going to find singing. And guess what? If you go study what the world worships, you're going to find people bowing, you're going to find people kneeling, and you're going to find people singing. I've never been to a rock concert before, but um, as I've, I've, I've been studying this, uh, you can watch people at these corn concerts in Metallica. Guess what? What are they doing? They're worshiping. They're raising their hands. They're bowing. They're getting on their knees. Uh, they're singing. They're doing all the stuff here. They're just doing it to a false god is what they're doing. And so we don't want to be like that. We want to worship God the way the Bible says that we should. Okay? So again, with those examples from the Old Testament, that has nothing to do with your Sunday morning liberal church worship. No. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. And you say, well, they're singing praises to God. Yeah, we'll get to that. Okay. Now, Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse 18. It says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So we as believers are commanded to be filled with the Spirit. We should try to be filled with the Spirit. We're not talking about being saved right now. You're already saved, right? You don't have to be filled with the Spirit to be saved. You just have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So with that being said, though, the Bible says that we should be filled with the Spirit. Why does he say that? You think about that. What happens if I fill up a cup right now? Is there room for anything else? No. Right? So if I'm filled with the Spirit, right, if I'm surrounding myself with truth and with hymns and songs and spiritual songs, there's not going to be much room for the world, is there? Right? So that's why we need to be filled with the Spirit. Look at verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, I've, we, 
as I was studying for this, you know, we pulled up some of the old uh, contemporary Christian songs that we used to listen to back in the day. And a lot of those songs are hard to even get stuck in your head. They're very convoluted. They're very, there's a lot of uh, sound and beats and stuff like that going on, right? And, and why is that? Because they're not interested in you making that melody in your heart. They're interested in making that melody in your mind. You ever had a song stuck in your head and it just won't go away? That's their goal. Their goal is not to put a melody in your heart, but to put it in your head so you won't forget it. And you'll keep buying the CDs and you'll pay them, you know, their, their new mansion, their new car, their new jet ski. Because really that's what it's all about. Right. That is what it's all about. Speaking to yourselves in Psalms, right? We just read some Psalms. Is that what this Christian garbage is today? No, no it isn't. No, it isn't. Hymns. Why do we sing hymns? Oh, that awful music. Where's the light show? Where's the drums? Where's the electric guitar? How do you worship? In hymns, Ephesians chapter 5, that's how we worship. We worship in spirit and in truth. You worship in emotionalism and feeling. Right. Right. That's what you do, liberal. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking to yourselves, right? So this, you know what this is? This requires action. This requires us to constantly make sure that we're speaking to ourselves, not just turning the radio on to the latest homie dog rapper, right. rapping about Smith and Wesson and, and flexing. <laughs> right? Speaking to yourselves and making melody in your heart. You know, it's a lot easier for us to have these hymns going through our head, which go down to the heart. You know it's true. I mean, look, there's a, you, you all know the hymn Amazing Grace, right? If we sing that, that edifies your soul, right? Does that really gratify your flesh? No, of course not, right? Now, there's a, a Christian rock band out there, and I can't remember the name. I don't even care. But they put that, that hymn to a worldly rock and roll type beat. And guess what that does to it? That perverts it. Yeah. It perverts it. So the sound does matter. The sound does matter, and it is important, because not only do the words communicate, but also the beat, also the melody. That's why he says making melody in your heart, and how do you do that? By hymns, by psalms, not by contemporary garbage. You know what the definition of contemporary is? It's about the now, the present. That's the definition, right? And there's a whole industry out there called contemporary Christian music. What are they saying? The now type music. Right? Study the history of sound uh, of, of Christian music from like the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, all the way up to now. It always m seems to match what the world's doing. If you take the latest contemporary Christian song today and you go and turn on your radio to just your, your normal pop rock and roll station, it's going to sound very similar. Yeah. It's going to sound very similar. Why is that? Because they're trying to keep up with the trends. They're all about the change. And the Bible says, be not given to them that are, or says meddle not with them that are given to change. Right. You see that? We don't, we're not interested in changing. We're interested in staying on the rock, staying on the truth, which is God's word. So let's, okay. let's move on here. Go back to John chapter four. So just real quick. My first point was there's a debate over worship. There was a debate over worship in John chapter 4. It was going on the entire Old Testament. It's going on today, and we need to know how to deal with this debate. We need to know how to answer this debate, right? Number two, we looked at some examples of what worship is. It's bowing, it's kneeling, and it's singing songs, right? It's giving reverence, it's giving our adoration, it's giving worth to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, number three, I want you to look at verse 23, John chapter 4, verse 23. Point number three is that true worshipers worship God in spirit and in truth. Let me say that again. Number three, true worshipers worship God in spirit and in truth. Look at verse 23. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. So if Jesus is telling us, hey, there's a, such a thing as true worshipers, what does that mean? There's such a thing as false worshipers, right? And we don't want to be anywhere near that. We don't want to be anywhere near that, right? So he says, hey, but the hour cometh now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father seeketh such to worship him. Does that mean that anything you do, as long as your heart's right, God's going to consider that worship? No, right? So yesterday, we were out soul winning, we knock on this lady's door, she tells us she works for Rock Harbor Church. You know Rock Harbor Church. You know, you're, we're, we're familiar with what they, what they teach and what they believe. You know, she's basically telling me you get to heaven by works, right? 
And they do all these works. They give her a verse, it's not by works. Oh yeah, it's not by what, by what you do. You just have to follow the Bible. <laughs> I was like, okay, what do you mean by that? And she says, well, you got to do the commandments. I'm like, so it works? No, it's not by works. You just got to follow the Bible, right? Because if you're not following the Bible, you're not saved. I'm like, wow, what in the world? I'm like, okay, so are you saying by like following the Bible, like the Great Commission where Jesus said, you know, go ye out into all the world and preach the gospel? And she's like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I'm like, what time do you guys go out soul winning? <laughs> What's your soul winning time? Oh, well, we go out to the homeless shelters and we feed people and we, and we have great worship and we feed people and we, we work with this organization, we work with that organization. There's an organization in Nampa that gives uh, food to the homeless people. And I'm like, so you do a lot of work, huh? <laughs> you know? It's like, oh, yeah. You know, and, and she's just going back and forth. But she says that that is how they worship God. That is how they fulfill the Great Commission. Well, here's the thing. Do you think that God is going to look at that and accept that as worship? No, because he says we, that true worship is worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. Well, if you're not even saved, if you're not even getting people saved, you're not even getting them sealed with the spirit, how in the world can they worship him? Right. You see what I'm saying? So she's convoluted. She's ate up as a soup sandwich, and that's a military term. Okay, it just means that you're out of order. You're, you're out of spec. That's all it means. Okay, you're, well, what's a soup sandwich? Well, guess what? You know, it's like when you get that French dip, right? That French dip sandwich and you keep dipping it in that ah sauce and it gets all soggy and wet and you just leave it in there. That's being ate up as a soup sandwich, right? It's not whole. It's not complete, okay? So when I say that, now you know what I'm talking about. I just, I got a lot of weird terms like that because I just come from a different background. I always assume that everybody knows what that means and you don't. And I have no idea why I'm talking about this right now. <laughs> so, oh yeah, John chapter 4, verse 23. Go to Psalms chapter one, 138. Go to Psalms chapter 138. So again, if there are true worshipers, then that means there are false worshipers. And, and you know the way that you know how this works, right? Anytime there's a situation like this where there's truth and, and falsehood, there's always going to be more falsehood, right. right? Because are most people saved? No. no. No, definitely not. The Bible says that. Most people are not saved, right? Why does the way that leadeth to what? Destruction. Right? So there's going to be more false worshipers out there in the world, in Christianity, than there are going to be true worshipers. And it's our job to discern that. Um, and, and now, while you're turning there to Psalm 130, I'm going to read for you a couple other Psalms. Because the synonym in the Bible for the word worship uh, that's often used is the word magnify. I just want you to hear this. Psalm 34, verse 3 says this, O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt His name together. So again, this is a form of worship. Magnify the Lord. We'll talk about that in a second. Psalm chapter 70, verse 4 says this, Let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee, and let such as love thy salvation say continually, let God be magnified. Okay? Now, with that in mind, with those two verses in mind, look at Psalm 138, look at verse 2. Psalm 138, verse 2 says this, I will worship toward thy holy temple, and praise thy name for thy loving kindness, and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. And why, does this, why does the Bible talk about magnifying God's name, magnifying his word? Because when you magnify something, what happens? Everything around it gets smaller, right? If I take a magnifying glass and I hold it on this paper here to, to one of the verses, guess what? That becomes large. Everything else becomes small, right? That is how we're supposed to treat God. And Sunday morning rock and roll band worship with the fog and the purple lights and the drums does not do that. That does not cut the bill, okay? Now go back to John chapter 4. Go back to John chapter 4. So we are supposed to magnify the Lord. Not just His name, right? Because a lot of these Christian churches, oh, they got no problem saying Jesus like 50,000 times in a song. Or what's that other idiot's name? Mike Servant Pop, right? <laughs> There's this guy, his name's Mike Servant Pop. He, and and, he's, and his, his thing, the reason why he's becoming famous in Christianity is because he gives his testimonies, right? You know, oh, I'm an ex-gangbanging homie dog, and you know what? And then he just like randomly, Jesus Christ! He just keeps blurting that out. That's not magnifying the Lord's name, okay? That's actually blasphemy. It's making his name common to man. That's the opposite of magnifying. That's magnifying him and his hominess over the Lord Jesus Christ, right? That is bizarre to say the least. But I've listened to this bozo, and he's not magnifying the Bible. I don't even think he uses a Bible. 
And if he does, it's not a King James Bible. It's probably some ESV or some NIV, right? And they call him the pop locker. <laughs> and I had to look this up. And because the style of dance that he uses is this like robot stuff, right? Like he gets on stage and he's like, Jesus Christ. And he's like, uh, 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 uh. I guess that's called pop locking. We had to look that up the other day as well. So I call him Mike Servant Pop. He's serving you up a bunch of, you know what? <laughs> it ain't spirit and truth, I'll tell you that. So look at verse 24, John chapter 4, verse 24. It says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him should, if they feel like it, worship him in spirit and truth. Oh, okay, sorry. That must have been the NIV. Hold on, let me, let me read that again. God is a spirit, and they that worship him, oh, must worship him in spirit and truth. Amen. So guess what that means? It's not optional. Right. It's not optional. You have to worship him in spirit and in truth truth so with that being said you have to be saved and now i want you to look at this here uh, skip down a few verses to verse 39 john chapter 4 verse 39 john chapter 4 verse 39 look at the result here it says and many of the samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified he told me all that i ever did verse 40 so when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. So why did they believe? They believed because of the word. What does the Bible say? That we have to magnify the word. That that is a form of worship when we magnify the word. So somebody says, how do you worship? You know what? We worship by magnifying not only the name Jesus Christ, but we also magnify his word. Amen. We magnify His Word. We lift up the Bible. We lift up doctrine. We lift up God's words because that's what saves people. That's what puts people in the right spirit, the saving spirit. And that's how you can really begin to worship God. So going back to the analogy I was using earlier, you know, with the Rock Harbor lady who feeds ham sandwiches to the poor and believes that God's just going to accept that because obviously He'll just do whatever you want. Right? right? He'll just do whatever you want and accept whatever you have. And that's obviously not true. That's, that's, that's not the God. He says you must worship him in spirit and in truth. And by just going around and giving unsaved people food, look, that's great. I'm all about helping people. But you know what? What shall it profit a man to gain the whole world but to lose his very own soul? Right, right. They're not teaching people how to be saved. So therefore, they aren't even saved. They're not even worshiping God. They can't worship God, nor can the people that they're helping worship God. Because they don't know anything about the Bible. They don't know anything about the Spirit. Now, in order to really worship God, you do have to be saved. And I'm going to prove this to you because he says, you uh, go to John chapter 3. Over and over again, you must worship him in spirit. In spirit and in truth. So let's talk about that here for a moment. What does that mean that you worship him in spirit? What, what, what does the Bible say about that? What does that mean? John chapter 3, look at verse 3. Very, very famous passages in the Bible. I know you're familiar with this. But look at verse 3. This is where Nicodemus comes and questions Jesus. And he says this. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Right? And not only can he not see the kingdom of God, but he cannot see truth. Now, verse 4. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And, and he, the, j, just like what, I, what did I just say? He's not saved at this point. I don't know if he ever does get saved, but he can't receive truth. He's actually like, what are you talking about, Jesus? What do you mean I have to be born again? Right? See, what Jesus is saying, hey, it's too late. Once you're a sinner, you're always a sinner. You can't go back into your mother's womb and start over again. That's why you have to be born again. Right? You have to be made new. You have to get that second chance, and that second chance is a free gift. Look at verse 5. He said, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Don't let the Mormons tell you that this is talking about water baptism, because it's not. He's simply saying, uh, can't, Except a man be born of the water, meaning born physically, right? Born physically. And of the Spirit, by being saved, is what he's talking about. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. Look at verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. 
So you have to worship God in spirit and in truth. Can you worship Him without spirit? No, oh, you can't. You can say you do all day long. It doesn't mean God accepts it. Because He doesn't. There's a requirement. He says you must. You must. You have to. There's no option. This is not optional. You have to worship Him in spirit and truth. Look at verse 7. He says, Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Now go to John chapter 6. Go to John chapter 6. <clears throat> John chapter 6, verse 63 says this, It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. One more time. What is it that quickens? It's the Spirit, right? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. So does the contemporary music of the world today that's driven by the flesh, does that profit? No, it doesn't. So why would we want to pattern our worship service after the world? It makes no sense unless there's an agenda, right? Unless it's after the order of the devil. And a lot of people, oh, you think everything's after the devil. No, not everything. But you know what? The light show, the drums, the sensual music, right? The trendiness, that is of the devil. That is of the world because that's what he's about. But he says, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. But he says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So in order to worship God, guess what? This book right here, the Bible, your Bible has to be involved. Right. right? So when you get your definition of worship, guess what? It better be coming from this book right here, not from Hillsong, right. not from Lecrae, not from Bun B or Bizzle <laughs> or Pyrex. Okay, not from those people. And those are Christian homie rappers. Right. <laughs> Go back to John chapter 4. So he says you must worship him in spirit and in truth. Right? The Bible has everything to do with worship because that's how we're saved. You're saved by hearing the word of God and putting your trust and your faith on Jesus Christ. After that, you're sealed by the Holy Ghost, by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Right? And what is it? It says that the, the, the God's words, they are spirit and they are life. And so we have to have these in order to worship. But then he says, in truth. And so let's talk about that for a moment. Look at verse 25. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Look at verse 26. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Now turn to John chapter number 15. John chapter 15. And so we're starting to see here about this idea of spirit and truth. We're starting to see the truth always goes back to the word of God. These two things work hand in hand. They work together. Look at John chapter 15, verse 26. John chapter 15, verse 26 says this, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. You see that? So according to this verse, what is the spirit of truth? That's the Holy Ghost. That's the Holy Spirit, right? Now, the problem today is that the Pentecostals and the Charismatics, they take this way out of order, way out of context, and they have these, these altar calls, if you will, where they have people running around like chickens with their heads cut off, right? They're flopping around on the floor, and they're saying that the Holy Ghost is making them do that. Um, it, what else do they do? They, they, you know, they get up there and they sing these songs usually before these events happen, right? And they've got like two or three ladies up there and they're getting all into that microphone, getting that thing real close, you know, really pouring it on hard, you know, and the people singing the songs. I mean, they're just really, what's that one that we watched? The Holy Ghost Hokey Pokey. <laughs> if you get time, look up this video on YouTube. It's called the Holy Ghost Hokey Pokey, right? And this is exactly what I'm talking about here. It's this charismatic worship service, right? They're doing it right, I guess, according to them. And this guy, they're singing this Hokey Pokey song that you probably may have sang when you were like two at the skating rink, okay? And they're singing this, and they're just really starting to pour the stuff on. And the next thing you know, people like start like wigging out and flipping out, and they're rolling around in the aisles. And, and he's just like, more spirit, more spirit, pour it on. And he's just basically a, a hypnotist is what he's doing. That's what these people are. They're professional hypnotists. They're master manipulators. And they're manipulating a crowd to act all bizarre uh, and just do the, the, the craziest things. People are running around barking like a dog. You know, and it's like, look, the Bible says let things be done in decency, you know, decently and in order. And that's not order. That's not order at all. 
<laughs> it's just straight trash. But the Bible says, when the comforters come, whom I will send unto you, from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. So when we're doing worship, we need to remember that these things are going to be testified from the Bible, from God's Word, right? Magnifying His Word, you know, when you bow down, you kneel. All the stuff that you don't see in your liberal church, yes. <laughs> basically, okay? Uh, turn one more chapter over, uh, John chapter 16. John chapter 16. So we're talking about truth right now. John chapter 16, look at verse 13. He says, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak and will show you things to come. So what is the Holy Ghost's mission? What does he do? What well, says right here? It says when he has come, which he has come now obviously in our day, he will guide you into all truth. What's the message at the liberal church? That all truth is relative, more or less. Rock Harbor lady yesterday, after we were dialoguing, I was giving her verses and you know trying to show her her error, you know that her faith is void because she's trusting in her works and her faith. Um, she said she she just makes a statement. She says all are welcome at our church, which is a huge red flag for us, right? What do you mean by all? It says well Catholics, Muslims. Oh, okay, that's fine. You know, and I don't care if they come here. Come on down, so we can get you saved. But I said, do you think a person has to believe? on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved and go to heaven. And she says, now that I don't know. <laughs> Big shocker there, boy, I was, I was shocked. Actually, I wasn't. I was expecting, that's why I asked the question, you know. <laughs> and I, I quoted her, you know, John 14, 6, you know, Jesus said, I'm the way, the, spirit, you know, the truth, and the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And she's just like, oh, yeah, but, you know, you know, some people like in India, they got to follow the light that they have. People in, you know, Sudan, they got to follow the light that they have. Basically, Billy Graham stuff. Right? That's what Billy Balaam taught. Right? It's not what the Bible says. And you know what that tells me? The Holy Ghost is not in her worship service. It's not even in her church. Because the Bible says, how be when he's come, he will guide you into all truth. Right? So it's important that you're saved. You have to have the Spirit in order to be guided in truth to be able to worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay? Now let's move on. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 30. We're just going to take a few looks here of how important God's Word is regarding worship in the Bible. So we're going to go to Deuteronomy 30. I'm going to have you go to Acts 24 and then 1 Corinthians 14. So first, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter number 30. Look at verse 17. This is what God's telling the, the children of Israel here. He says, but if... The, look at verse uh, 17. Deuteronomy 30, 17. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land whither thou passest over Jordan to go possess it. So what happens when we remove the truth out of our worship? You replace that. People will replace that with something else. Look at verse 17. But if thine heart turn away, how does your heart turn away? He says, so that thou will not hear. So when you turn your heart away, and you don't hear God's word, or you won't hear God's word anymore, you're going to backside, you're going to go after other things that are not godly, after other gods, right? And that's what these churches are doing. They will not hear. They will not regard the word of God. And so God has given them delusion. You have to be deluded to read John 14, 6, and then turn around and say, well, I think as long as somebody worships Buddha, but they do it with good intentions, they'll go to heaven. Right. You have got to be deluded to believe that. Because nobody, look, we, we tell atheists all the time, John 14, 6, and we're like, yeah, I believe that's what the Bible says. They may not agree with it and get saved, but they at least receive it. Right. Right. It seems like the agnostics and the atheists in this community have more biblical knowledge and are more receptive than the Christians are. And why is that? It's because of this verse right here. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou will not hear, but shall be drawn away. Right? This is how people get drawn away into false worship. Is They, re, they, they just neglect the, the Word of God. That's all you got to do. Close your Bible. Don't read it anymore. And you'll get drawn away. Your heart will turn away. Now, go to Acts chapter 24. Because like I said, worship is bowing down. It's kneeling. It's singing. It's doing those things in the right order. But it's also, it's also heavily dependent on the Word of God. Jeremiah, I'm going to read for you Jeremiah 7, 2, while you're turning to Acts 24, and it says this, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, and proclaim there this word, and say, 
Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah, that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Guess what? Hearing the word of God goes hand in hand with worship. Do you hear the word of God in Hillsong songs? No, you don't. Do you hear the word of God in Bun B's rap songs or, or Bizzle or P-Dub? You don't hear the word of God in those. You hear a strange fire. You hear a strange noise is what you hear. Listen to this. This is what Paul's, uh, this, is, this is about Paul's testimony here, right? Paul, you know, on trial, appealing, he's getting questioned. And, he, and they're like, okay, Paul, what's going on? Why are you in trouble here? Look what he says. Look at verse 13. It says this, Neither can they prove the things where they are now accusing me. So Paul's having accusations brought against him that are false, right? And he wants justice. Look at verse 14. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers. Now don't miss this. Believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. So let me ask you a question. Does the Rock Harbor, does Life Church, does Tree City Church of the Nazarene, does Valley Shepherd, do they believe that we have God's word today? No, no they don't. They believe in the original manuscript argument, yeah. right? Or, or, we're original manuscript only or scholarship only. They don't believe that God has the ability to preserve truth or to preserve his words today. Right? So are they really worshiping God? No, they're not. They're not. They might have a feel-good sing-along song up front with a rock band and ladies and, you know, and, and, and their worship pastor with 18 holes in each leg of his skinny jeans. But that's not worship. Worship does involve the Word of God. Read the verse again, 20, Acts 24, 14. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way they, which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. How does Shield of Faith Baptist Church worship God? Well, we do it by singing, right? And, uh, and we do it by bowing down and praying to God. We, I'm sure we all do that in here. Hopefully we all do. We all bow our heads at least. I see that. Except for the one guy that got the boot, right? <laughs> but also... We believe all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. We believe the Bible. So guess what, liberal boy? How do we worship? We worship by believing the Word of God. That's how we do it. Look at verse 15. And have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And obviously he was being attacked by the Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection. Now um, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 14. 1 Corinthians chapter number 14. Don't forget what Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy word, right? Thy word is truth. What does sanctify mean? To separate, to be against the world, to be holy, right? That's why we don't have a worldly worship service in our church. Because we understand what the Bible teaches about worship, and that's what we follow. We, hey, when Jesus said you must worship him in spirit and truth, you know what? We believe that. We follow that. That's the difference. That's how we worship. We worship by believing the things that are written like Paul said. That is worship. Now, here's the effects of real worship. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, look at verse 23. The word of God produces real worship. Look at this. 1 Corinthians 14, 23. If... Therefore, the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues and there's some, I'm sorry, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? Now, when he's saying speaking in tongues here, he's not talking about this gibberish garbage that the Pentecostals do. Okay. He's talking about a language that you do not know that God has given you the ability to know and understand and to speak. We don't have time for that this morning. Look at verse 24. But if all prophesy, meaning if all preach, all teach, and there come in one that believeth not or unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. You see the power of real worship? You see the power of real preaching? Of, of when you go to a church where the preacher actually believes that these words are preserved and he's not casting doubt by saying, only in the original manuscripts can we really get the truth. Or in the Greek, this word means that. Or in the Hebrew, this word means that. All that does is devalue God. That's not magnifying the word of God. That's magnifying the person saying that. Right. That's magnifying the scholar. That's magnifying the professor. Yeah. 
and that is not the way that God said we should do things. Look at verse 25. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. So when you have a church that really understands worship and does worship the God by magnifying his word, what does that produce? It produces converts. It produces real life uh, uh, gifts. It, it, it gets people saved. It gets people convicted. It gets people convinced. It makes people really want to change and do what's right. So real worship produces real worship. What a concept. Dogs produce dogs. Cats produce cats. Humans produce humans. Go to Mark chapter number 7. Mark chapter number 7. So Mark chapter number 7, look at verse number 5. We're going to read verses 5 through 9. And we're going to kind of compare this to what we see today. So Mark chapter 7, verse 5. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why walk not the disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? So what's the debate here? What's the argument here? Right? The Christian leaders of their day, what do they want? Why are your people, Jesus, why aren't they doing things the way that we do them today? Right? Is that, that's basically what's going on here. Look at verse 6. He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And that's exactly what we find when we go out into the community. Why don't you have contemporary worship? Why don't you have the traditions that we have? Well, you know why? You really want to know why? It's because of this verse right here, because they're hypocrites. It's, that's why we don't want to be hypocrites. We don't want to just honor God with our lips saying, Jesus Christ, and, you know, and, and just blurting things out there. Right? We want to have real, meaningful, biblical worship. And that's, this is exactly what you're seeing. Look at verse 7. How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Yeah. You see that? That's what Hillsong does today. That's what Rock Harbor does today. That's what Tree City Church of the Nazarene does today. Yeah. That's what Treasure Valley Baptist Church does today. And you say, why are you calling them out? Well, Jesus did. Right? You, you could read Mark chapter 7, verse 6 to some liberal today, and they'd be like, well, that's probably not in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, that's probably not in the original manuscripts. Well, you've got to really know Greek and Hebrew before you go around and explaining and judging people. Look, he called people hypocrites, and he called them a lot worse than that, too, in the Bible. Look at verse 8. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and of cups, and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. That's exactly what we have going on today. It's exactly what we have going on today. That's why people are able to watch our live stream or watch our YouTube videos and say, you know what? You're not doing it right. You don't really worship. No, you don't really worship. And in fact, most of you that are saying this junk aren't even saved. Go to Daniel chapter number three. We're going to kind of move on here. We're going to kind of talk about music here and the effects of music regarding worship. Daniel chapter 3. We kind of read this uh, a, a couple Wednesdays ago. But I want you to see that the world clearly understands the benefit and the use and the effects of music. Daniel chapter 3, look at verse 4. I should have told you to keep your place in Psalms so you can get to Daniel, but go past, <laughs> go past the, the big prophets, right? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. You'll, you'll be right there in Daniel. Daniel chapter 3, look at verse 4. Then an herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image. So right off the bat, what do we see here? We see that the government wants something from the people, right? They want them to follow a commandment. They want them to follow a program. That's what it says in verse 4, right? Verse 5, and he says, at what time ye hear the music, right? So people are going to hear this music and be like, what's going on? What's the, what's the point of this? Look at verse 6. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. 
Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Now, why didn't Nebuchadnezzar just say, hey, at 3 o'clock, worship the golden image? At 4 o'clock, worship the golden image. At 9 o'clock, worship the golden image. At breakfast, worship the golden image. Why didn't he say that? Why use music? Because it influences your behavior. That's why they did it. It influences you. And a lot of people, oh, no, it's just, it's just the words that do it. As long as the, the, the words are good, it doesn't matter about the beat. Look, these aren't evil instruments here. You see that? But they're being used to manipulate the people and to accomplish a goal. And that goal is to worship a false idol, to worship an idol, to worship a false god. That's what the world does. You know, the military uses this today. If you're on an army base at 6 o'clock in the morning, you're going to hear a cannon go off, and then you're going to hear, uh, what is it, colors or taps play. Why is that? Because it, So when you hear the cannon go off, you're supposed to face where you know the nearest flag is and then listen to the music. It's supposed to get you in the right mood. Where do you think they got that from? They got that from this chapter right here because it puts you in that right mood. And look, I'm all about being American. I'm glad we have our rights and our freedoms, but I'm just simply saying it, that it's, it's just an example of what they do. If you're on board an aircraft carrier at 730, I think it's 730, maybe it's 7 o'clock. It, it's the same thing, right? No, it's 8 o'clock actually on the Navy bases. At 8 o'clock, they play the music. And if you're driving a car, you have to stop. And if you don't stop, you'll get arrested. You'll get a ticket. Somebody will make you stop. And you have to stop and you have to face the nearest flag. Even as a civilian, look, it doesn't, it's it, on a Navy base, on an Army base, on an Air Force base, on a Marine base, it doesn't matter. You stop when you hear the music and you face that flag. Now, you know what would be awesome is if when you heard the music, you faced God. Maybe you did some real worship, but that's not what our government's about. Right. right? That's not what it's about. I just want you to see that the world understands. They understand this concept. They understand that music can be used for evil. I mean, they understand it can be used for good, but they understand it can be used for evil. And that's why so much money is pumped into the entertainment industry. That's why it's pumped into these, getting these musicians on the radio and getting them in your ears. Look, who's the most popular um, uh, secular rapper today? I, we, nobody in here probably knows. It doesn't matter. Let's just take that individual. Let's just take the biggest rocker. What is it? Uh, maybe it's corn these days, or I don't know if they're still around. <laughs> I think they're still around, right? <laughs> You could take these guys and you could probably go to someone's garage around here and find somebody who's 10 times more talented at singing and playing instruments than those guys. But why won't they get the job? Well, I'll tell you why. Because there's something that you probably have to do to get to that level of, of celebrity status. And if you listen to these celebrities talk, they're all, what are they always saying? I gave my soul to the devil. Like, that's a real thing. They really do do that. And the ritual and stuff that goes on with that, we don't maybe know all the details. Sometimes they allude to it, but it's, I guarantee you it's perverted. <laughs> I guarantee you it's not something that most people want to take part in. That's why there's, they say, well, there's very few people that can make it to that status. is because there's very few people that are willing to go through the sick, perverted rituals that they have you do to get to the top. Okay? So go to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. So we understand... We need to worship God. We have to worship God in spirit and in truth. Now, that leads us into the subject of music because that's what the debate is today in our country. It's over the music. It's over the feeling. It's over the flashy show, right? Well, what did we learn in Daniel? We just learned that music by itself, apart from words, can influence you. It can put you in the mood that the person playing it wants to put you into. Now, Let's look at James chapter 3, look at verse 13. It says this, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. Right? So we want to be people like in verse 13. That, that's the kind of people that we want to be. We want to be wise and endued with knowledge. We want to take the knowledge that we learn on Sunday and apply it on Monday Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, so that we can gain wisdom. Because wisdom is the use of knowledge, right? That's what he's saying there. And what does that do? That produces a meek Christian, <clears throat> right? But in verse 14, he contrasts that by saying, but if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. You know what? What does the world's music and musicians 
uh, what, what, what's one thing that's common throughout all, all of these people? It's bitter, envying, and strife. Aren't they always fighting and, and bickering? I mean, you can go stand in the line at Fred Meyer and just look at the stupid little magazines there, and it's so-and-so rappers angry at this rapper, right? This rock and roll guy, he's angry at this person, and they're going to sue each other and fight each other, right? And that's what we want to copy for our, our, our worship service? You're out of your mind. You're out of your mind. Look at verse 15. So James goes on to further explain this, right? He says, this wisdom, right? Talking about the bad wisdom. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. What does earthly mean? It means worldly. That's what he's saying there. Sensual, right? Here's the definition of that. Sensual. It's appealing to your senses, your physical senses, i.e. your flesh, which we're supposed to crucify and put away, right? Which we have to battle with all the time. But here, here's the definition. It says, relating to or involving gratification of the senses and physical, especially blank pleasure. Hopefully you can read between the lines. I'm not going to say the word, okay? You get the point. Get two or three ladies up at Tree City Church of the Nazarene, and you'll see what I'm talking about. That's not being done to magnify the word of God or to lift up God. That's being done to control the people. Whether they know it or not, it doesn't matter. That's what it is. And you know why we know that? Because of this chapter right here, who is a wise, a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you, let him show out of good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. When you get up on stage and you're wagging your backside and you got all these holes in your pants and you're trying to look as good as you can to seduce people, right. guess what? That's not being meek. Right. That's being a hoe. Okay, that's what that's being. Okay. Welcome to a real church who will tell you the truth. Amen. And the last thing he says, devilish. So guess what? Guess what, man? It's satanic. Yep. Yeah. It's satanic. You don't have to have the devil horns and the Marilyn Manson guys show up to be satanic. Yeah. All you have to do is pervert the truth. Yep. That's all you got to do. Yep. That is all you have to do. Now, I love this. Every time I'm going to preach a sermon, man, something always comes to help us out. So, I got to read this to you. I got this flyer in the mail. What was it? Okay, didn't Friday? Same. Yeah, it don't matter. You guys get one? You guys get this? So you already know what I'm about to say. I'm going to read it. Who didn't get one of these? All right, so we got a few. Listen to this. Ooh, all right. <clears throat> Consider yourself invited to a place where you can just be yourself, no matter what that looks like. Okay. There's no pressure to be something you're not. There's no dress code. Just come as you are. Does that mean you can show up naked like some of the demon-possessed people did? <laughs> There's no catch. Seriously, please know that you don't have to believe in God to hang out here. Hmm. <laughs> Good thing you didn't read it. So you don't have to believe in God to hang out at this place. And it's called Vector Church. Okay, now listen to this. They'll vex your soul. The music is loud like a rock concert and the party is big. We've also got stuff for your kiddos, if you got them, and coffee that'll get your motor running. Cuz, C-U-Z. I think Bun Bizzle may have wrote this. Because <laughs> we know Sunday mornings can be rough. So we're, what are you waiting for? Join us for the party Sundays at 11 a.m. in the Death Proof Coffee venue. For more information, check out our website. I didn't check it out yet because I was mad enough when I read this the first time. And it says the party's here. It's on Fairview and Five Miles. Not very far from here. Vector Church. Wow. Think about that. No matter what. I mean, just come as you are. There's no catch. Seriously, please know that you don't have to believe in God to hang out here. Look, we want people to say they don't believe in God to come here at least a couple times so we can try to get them saved. But there's going to come a point where you get the boot. You get the boot on out of here. Because church is for believers. And we've seen what happens when we dwell with people that don't believe like us. Right? So you know what, Vector Church? You absolutely suck. Amen. What a joke. Man. That's James chapter 3, verse 15. That's earthly, that's sensual, that's devilish. I don't even know what to say right now. I mean, I read it before I came here, but not like that. <laughs> All right. Look at verse 16. We'll just start there. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. <laughs> I'll tell you what, you go to this stupid church, this vector church, you're probably going to find envying and strife. 
And I, I guarantee you, you're going to find confusion because I was confused by reading that. Yeah. And, and that's evil. Yeah. That is straight evil. Verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's pure. That's what the Bible's talking about here, right? That's without partiality. That lady I talked to from Rock Harbor yesterday, she was with partiality. Yeah. And she's an employee there. So that means that their other employees are probably worse. Yeah. Verse 18. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. And blessed are the, fee the, of the, the peacemakers. But anyways, look at... Uh, um, Let's see here. I got to hurry up and be done, but go to Ecclesiastes chapter number seven. How beautiful are the feet of them that bring the gospel of peace. Right? In James 3, 18, what does he say? And the fruit of the righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. And that's all we're trying to do. We're trying to make peace through using the sword of God, the word of God. Now, while you're turning to Ecclesiastes, I'm going to read a couple more verses. So how music ought to be done. It ought to be done like we see here in James. It ought to be done like how we do it here. It ought to be done by putting away the earthly, by putting away the sensual, by putting away the devilish. That's how we worship here. That's how we should worship because Jesus said you must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's the whole point. Psalm 29, 2 says this, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. We are commanded to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. What's holiness? That's being separate from the world. So when people take Jesus and they, and they paint pictures of him you know, with dreadlocks and, and all that stuff, and they say, you know, he's all inclusive, and, and this is Jesus our homie, and you buy these t-shirts, guess what? That's not worshiping him in the beauty of holiness. That's worshiping him in vain. That is blasphemy. That is making him common with man. That is not okay with God. I don't care what anybody says. So you say, how is the music supposed to be done? By giving glory that's due his name, in worshiping the Lord in the beauty of holiness. That's why the Word of God is so essential when it comes to worship. Because this book here is all about how He is holy and we aren't. Right. Right. It's against man. So all music that's sung in church or to God, it should be done in the beauty of holiness. Shall we gather at the river, right? Uh, I mean, look look around. Look at, look at these signs. There's a reason why we have amazing grace. Um, you know, what? Great is thy faithfulness. We've got, you know, at the cross, we've got these examples of these hymns. This is what we're about. We're about worshiping God and singing songs to God that do, that, that basically uh, accomplish the goal of worshiping Him in beauty, in the beauty of His holiness, is what I'm trying to say. All right? So the music should be separate from the world. I had you turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 7 for this reason. Verse 5, we're going to learn a great truth here, and that is church is better Right? A church where you hear Bible preaching is better than your rock concert. Look at verse 5. It says, It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. So it's better for you to come to church and get your face ripped off and get your toes stepped on than it is to be in, in the midst of the fog machine, right? <laughs> and Bun B and Bizzle and Pyrex and all these rappers and the instruments and the thing that produces mood. You get what I'm saying? This is important. Keep your place there. Uh, go, to, go, to, go to Proverbs chapter six, uh, 16. Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16. And while you're turning there, I'm going to reread for you John 4, 23 and 24, where we first started. It says, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. So we get that now. We understand what that means now, right? He's looking for people that want to worship him in spirit and in truth, right? And then we learn this in spirit, meaning in verse 24, he says, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship worship him in spirit and in truth what is the title of the sermon it's worldly worship that will play you like a fiddle if you subject yourself to that worldly worship it's going to play you like a fiddle it's going to make you do things that are fickled that's what it does it produces a great high on sunday morning but when sunday night comes around you're turning on hbo and cinemax and you're going to the movies and you're listening to, to corn stone temple pilots 
seven dust and all this other Metallica garbage, right? That's what they do. We knocked on a guy's door the other day when he had a Corona shirt on. But he goes to a church that has the great band, man, right? They have the great band, dude. They got the band. They got the fog machine. They've got the lights. They've got the emotionalism. What does that do? And the guy's like, you know, he's telling us, oh, I'm saved. I serve God, you know, and we're trying to get it out of him, right? And he's like, I go to church, you know, two, three times a month. Show me that in the Bible. You're supposed to be here anytime the doors are open. That's what the Bible says. Worldly worship that will play you like a fiddle. We understand that there is a type of worship out there that is false, that is not done by the true worshipers. And that type of worship, my friend, will play you like a fiddle. It will get you emotionally high on Sunday and leave you emotionally dry on Monday. You're there in Proverbs chapter number 16. I'll prove it to you. Look at verse 3. The Bible says this, Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. So a lot of people say, well, you know, you know, when we talk to them, they're like, man, I'm trying to read the Bible. I just can't. I'm trying to go to church, but I just can't. You know why? Because they haven't committed their works unto the Lord. See, the world's got it backwards. They tell you, you got to get the feeling first and the works will follow. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you commit your works first and then the actions and the feelings follow that. So you know what? You go against your flesh. You fight your flesh. You get your butt to church. You open this Bible up. You start reading it. You do the works. You commit your works to the Lord. And what does it say? And thy thoughts shall be established. You say, well, I can't read the Bible, blah, blah, blah. It's because you're not doing the works. You start with the works first. You start going soul winning. You start doing the things that you want to do. You start love. You say, I can't love my husband. You start loving your husband. Love is an action. Charity, you start doing those things. You say, I can't love my wife. You start loving your wife. You start doing those things. You do that action first, and then God says, and then he will establish your thoughts. Then you're going to want to do those things. That's what the Bible's saying here. So you know what? This worldly, sensual, devilish worship, it, it puts the feeling first, and then there's no action. It's not about the action. That's why these, we talk to these people, and they say they want to do right. They want to come here. They want to learn, right? But they can't. It's because they've got this thing backwards. They don't commit their works. And look, we're all about, you know, salvation's not by works. We get that. I'm not talking about salvation right now. I'm talking about being a disciple. I'm talking about growing in the Lord. That's what I'm talking about. You know, so you say, how do I get myself in gear? How do I get motivated? You choose to start acting. When you can force yourself to do those things, and God will establish you. God will make you want to read the Bible. God will make you want to do these things when you start first. Remember, God's not a Calvinist. He's not going to look down and say, I chose you to be a good disciple. I chose you just to go to hell. Or I chose you to do this, chose you to do that. No, it's not true. You commit your works first, and then the actions will follow. Here's an example of a contemporary Christian worship song here, and I'm almost done. It's called Here I Am to Worship by Hillsong Worship Team. Right? I used to sing this song. Many of you have been to other churches, you probably sang this song. Not all of it's bad, but I want to read to you the first few verses here. It starts out by saying this. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Okay. Opened my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Now these people on Sunday mornings, and they're real worship, right? They got the real worship. They're singing the song. Did you catch what the first few verses are? That's Calvinism. Light of the world, you step down in darkness, open my eyes. Right? So God made you? And they might say, well, that's not what we meant. Well, look, we need to worship God in spirit and in truth. And the songs that we sing need to be based off of doctrine. This is why we sing clear hymns. And look, not every song in the hymnal is okay. So there's some that we don't sing because they're bad. Like victory in Jesus, you know, and then I repented of all my sins. You know, we don't sing that because that's bad. But you know what? So is this. Beauty that made my heart to adore you. That just, to me, it sounds like Calvinism. That's what it sounds like. And then it says, hope of a life spent with you. Well, if I'm saved, I, I can know. The Bible says things were written that you may know. Right? It's in the book of John. It's in the book of, book of First John. It's all over the Bible. These things were written to produce faith so that we could know. Not just... Be like, oh, I, I, hope I, I, I hope I can live with you. See, because the big lie today is that you get your eternal life after you die. Right? That's what most of these people believe. They believe, oh, I, I believe God gives eternal life and you can never lose it. But what they don't tell you is they only believe you get that after you've done enough good works and you've followed the Bible. 
you know i mean and then the song goes on to just say shallow things you know king of all days oh highly exalted it's like look who doesn't know that here i am to worship what does that mean he goes I, it, a lot of stuff just doesn't even make sense it, and, and that's what a lot of these contemporary christian songs are they're just shallow maybe they're not sinful some of them a lot of them you know some of them they there's not any lies in them other than the beat that they want you to subscribe to right that's the problem if you were to take the beat away from a lot of these songs what's, what's that other one that's who's got one come on give me an example skillet. <laughs> yeah skillet yeah that, that's one i'll put you in a hot pan <laughs> which, which one mouth it one more time you're not speaking here i am to worship uh man what's that one Oh yeah, come just as you are. What is that trying to say? Come just as you are. You, you need to get saved. And we need to grow beyond as we are. That's the whole point of church. That's the whole point of this Bible. It's a, it's a big book. You see what I'm saying? There, there's another one where you know, you know you know these songs, right? They just chant things, right? Yeah. Oh, um, our God is an awesome God. That's the one I was thinking right. of, right? That one, our God is an awesome God. No, that is true, <laughs> right? But is that really? good worship i mean is that by singing that over and again, our god and, you know and it's just like man bang how many times are we going to say that how look i'd rather sing any of these hymns that teach us doctrine you know that helps us to make a good melody in our hearts right. throughout the week you know that helps us hide god's word in our hearts so that we won't sin against him that's what we're after we're after real worship worshiping in spirit and in truth and that come as you are stuff you know what are they really trying to say because i'll tell you what most of those churches They'll allow pedophiles in, the sodomites, the whole nine. They don't care. You know, you could come here as you are, and that's, that, that's their message. You know, look at how great we are. Look, we really worship God. We let everybody come in here, and we don't judge them. No, you've got that backwards, my friend. That's not what the Bible says. Oh, here's another part of the song. It says, well, I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. Well, I know what that costs. Acts chapter 2, verse 36. He's seeing this before, speaking of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. You see, you would know that, Hillsong. You would know that, Darlene Check, if you read the Bible. Maybe if you were saved, you would know that. But the point and the problem is these people aren't saved. They're manipulators. They're hypnotists. And they've hijacked the minds and the hearts of the people. And you know what? They don't worship God. In fact, they get played like a fiddle. And that's what I don't want to happen to this church. And you know what? It's what won't happen to this church. Amen. And we know that. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you so much for your word and for your truths. I just pray that you would always keep with us, Lord. Uh, keep us uh, full of zeal. Keep us full of your spirit, Lord, so there's no room for the world. And uh, just help us to have great fellowship today and soul winning, Lord. And please bless the evening service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.